Good evening. Uh, so thank you all for being um, in this in this event. Uh, this is the fourth of uh, this talk in the series. We call it Let's Talk Climate Change, organized by the Climate Center for Climate Change Sustainability at Azim Prems University. Uh, so basically, everybody these days, you know, we don't really need to, you know, like think twice about climate change and what's going on, right? And um, the monsoon is arriving, and uh, we already crossed or seen some of the heat event uh, that has actually, you know, like gone through the country. And this is probably the right time to think about climate action and also with, uh, you know, from an optimist point of view. So today's talk is, uh, that's why it's very special and it's very timely. And hopefully, you know, you guys, uh, you all, uh, like, get to interact with the speaker after you listen to her. Uh, so we are very glad to have uh, Ulka Kelker uh, with us today. Uh, she is the director of climate program at the World Resources Institute, India. She has a background in economy uh, by, by, by training, and she has worked on climate policy for more than 20 years in collaboration with scientists, engineers, geographers, uh, architects, and bankers. She has done fieldwork in seven Indian states, and her research has been published in leading journals over the years. Uh, Ulka is a co-chair of the Think 20 task force on clean energy and green transitions. Uh, she was part of the uh, Government of India Long-Term Low Emissions Development Strategy Task Force on Transport National Committee for uh, Carbon Neutral Village Awards and Science Technology and Innovation Policy Thematic Group on Energy, Environment and Climate Change. And before uh, WRI, she worked as a consultant uh, of climate assessment specialist for the Asian Development Bank and was a fellow at the uh, Energy and Resource Institute. So I'd like to welcome you know, Kelka to, to uh, you know, uh, give the talk. And uh, just to add to what I said, as part of the Center for Climate and Sustainability, we take uh, communicating about climate quite seriously. So uh, we are doing several things. So along with this, let's talk climate change. We are organizing, uh, we have been organizing, we call it the festival. Uh, last year we did a reverse of life. This year we are, we are doing forest of life. So I really want to encourage you guys you know, to, to check that out well. Ulka, please come. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for the battling your way through the traffic. And I'm sure there are many other better things to do on a Tuesday evening. Thank you for choosing to spend your time looking at data and talking about a serious topic like climate change. Um, I'm very happy to uh, talk about this issue from the perspective of a young person. I'm very happy that there's so many young people in the audience today. Um, usually when we uh, talk about climate change, long-term pathways in particular that I work on with older people, especially those who are in power, who are in a position to make decisions. They always talk, you know, when they start, they say, I won't be around in, 90, in 2070, but dot, dot, dot. I won't be there in 2050, but dot, dot, dot. But all of you will be there in 2050, 2070. In fact, a child who's born today will be alive in 2100 at the turn of the century. You know, the period for which all our climate change projections are usually made for. So this is really something, you know, from a perspective of a young person. And uh, so uh, when we talk about climate change kind of strategies, for older people, it seems too far. For younger people, there is an impatience. You know, these things seem too slow. Uh, the problem seems too overwhelming. We have relentless news coverage. This week itself, you might have heard about the news. Uh, of course, Bangalore also suffered. Um, from extreme rainfall events. But in Italy, for example, they had something like six months of rainfall in one and a half days in 36 hours. And it fell on ground that had been made hard and dry because there wasn't enough snowfall in the winter. Somalia, I think, was in the news this morning that again, after the very prolonged drought, there was this torrential rainfall and people have been flooded. So there's all this, I mean, if you open, for example, Guardian newspaper, there's always like this red box and it always depresses me in the morning. Um, but yeah, but it's hard not to get overwhelmed and it's also hard not to distance yourself, you know, to feel as if we can't do much about it or anything that we do is perhaps too little. 
So that's really the kind of context, and I want to break it down. I'll start with a few slides, maybe six or seven slides, and then we'll move on to this interactive dashboard that we have. It's on the internet, but unfortunately you can't get it on your phones. You have to, you have it on a laptop. Um, but we'll kind of try to talk through it. Two of my colleagues are here, I might ask them for help. Alpan and Dev are here, they work on this, on this dashboard. Um, but let's, let's just get started. So this is just by way of context, you probably all know about all this, that there is a lot of um, kind of announcements by countries, particularly what are called net zero uh, target years that are being set. So about 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions are now covered by these net zero targets. And what these colors tell you is that the countries that are shaded in yellow those have 2050 as their target year. So for example, the United States, it aims to become net zero in terms of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. The orange ones like India or China are after 2050. So our net zero target year is 2070, China's is 2060. And the blue ones, just some of them, actually have very early net zero target years. So as early as 2035 or 2040, including Germany and some of the Scandinavian countries. So what does this uh, really mean? Some of these are laws, like Australia just passed a law, US also has a law, so it's not just an announcement. Others, you know, they are more in the nature of political pledges. Um, now what does this mean? This means that before the Paris Agreement was signed, the uh, you know, 2015 agreement, all of the science was saying that uh, we are very likely to have four degrees Celsius of global warming, four degrees beyond the Industrial Revolution, which is just impossible to understand what that could mean. But with the Paris Agreement, with these short-term announcements that were made, 2030 targets, it came down to under three degrees Celsius. Yeah? And with these net zero targets, if they're actually met by 2050 or 2060, then by the end of the century, we're on track to go under two degrees Celsius. Now, of course, all of this lies in the future. Of course, all of this has to actually happen. But I just wanted to capture this one slide and say that things are not as hopeless or as, um, you know, just overwhelming as they seem. There is a progress. Um, of course, we have to make sure that these predictions, these projections actually happen. And that's why a lot of the incremental work that you see in these COPs that seem to happen year after year with a lot of talk and not much happening, a lot of that is about going on pushing those targets, going on pushing the, the boundaries. What gives me optimism uh, or what keeps me positive is uh, data like this. So for example, uh, the cost of solar power fell by 85% in the last 10 years. The cost of onshore wind fell by more than half in the last 10 years. Same with the cost of batteries. So uh, you can't really see, but down there, there isn't somehow, it's not showing up, but down there, below that blue line is actually the cost of, of coal. And the blue line is crossing the cost of coal. So all of this solar, wind is becoming cheaper than coal. So today, if someone wanted to decide whether to set up a coal power plant or the solar plant or the wind plant, they would actually choose the cheaper one, which is renewable energy. So that's something that, that is a trend that is, that is definitely happening. And as a result of that, Every year, the predictions of experts are turning out to be wrong. They're turning out to be too conservative. So those colored lines are actually the International Energy Agency's World Energy Outlook, which comes out every year. Every year, they pre predict their best estimate of how much solar PV is going to happen, going to be invested in. And every year, they are proved wrong, because the actual is that black line, which is just going up, 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 up. Right? So experts also often don't know that, that the ground realities are happening faster. A Couple of other things in terms of actual policies that are being put in place around the world. So in, the, in Europe, for example, there are going to be no new fossil fuel cars by 20, from 2035. So 2035 is just, what, 13 years from now. So they're gonna slowly phase out these fossil fuel cars, bring in electric vehicles. But any Indian company, for example, that wants to sell cars to the European market, just 10 years, 12 years down the line, is going to start investing in electric vehicle technology. It's not going to um, want to keep on investing in fossil fuel technology. Another important kind of um, uh, sort of tool that governments have is public procurement. So often when we think of government policy, we think in terms of taxes or subsidies or standards. But the US actually has a kind of uh, rule 
that if the central government, the federal government, buys any kind of steel or cement or asphalt for any kind of construction, it has to be low carbon steel, low carbon cement, low carbon asphalt. So the government's procurement mandate also gives a signal to industry that if you want to sell, um, you better make sure that um, it is low carbon. Um, with that, let me just move on to the uh, dashboard that I was talking about. And this is a book that I think you see nowadays in a lot of airport bookshops. It's actually about time management. And the author is a philosopher. He says, you know, we often live our lives as if we have all the time in the world. But actually, if you break it down, if you think about it, it's a very finite amount of time. And he calculates a human lifetime as being 4,000 weeks. Um, if we think about the next decade, you know, these targets that we're talking about, 2030, it's something like 500 weeks. What will we do in these 500 weeks, right? And then beyond that. That's really the kind of um, thinking with which I'm going to try to show you this simulator, yeah? So now my talking part is over and I'm going to ask you to give me ideas and suggestions to feed into this dashboard. So let's just first try to understand the size of the problem. Does anybody know what are India's greenhouse gas emissions right now as a share of the world's emissions? So if I tell you that the world's emissions are about 50 billion tons of CO2 in a year, do you know how much of that 50 comes from India in a year? Wild guesses, I'm not expecting anybody to be an expert. Sorry? 10? Yeah? Two, three, four? I think you're all about in the right ballpark figure, right? It's around two, three, right? It's a, it's a small fraction of the 50 that we are putting out um, into, the, into the world every year. Now, uh, everybody keeps talking about how India is this fast-growing economy, we are using a lot of coal, all of that, right? Population is growing. So by 2050, by the middle of the century, or let's say 2047, if you want to use that as a milestone year, this two or three that we have now, how much is it going to become? Is it going to grow exponentially? Is it going to grow slowly? How much is that? Is it going to be double, five times, ten times? Hmm? Two or three. Have you attended my talk before? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. So let's just enter this simulator and see what happens with uh, India's emissions. So that's the... Um, if we look at only CO2, for example, that's what we see. So it's around 2,000 right now, and it's going up to something like 4,000 over the middle of the century. Where do you think the CO2 is coming from? Which are the main sectors or the main causes of these greenhouse gas emissions? Exactly. Exactly. So let's take it one by one, right? Power sector. So power sector emissions, I think everybody feels are pretty important. How much do you think they are going to grow over the next 30 years? Is it going to be the same kind of growth as the economy as a whole? So if power sector emissions are, say, let's say around 1,000, 1,500 now, how much do you think it's going to be in 2050? What will be the shape of that curve? Will it go up higher? Yeah? Let's just have a look at it. We find it's actually flat, yeah? And this is the business as usual reference scenario. This is current trends continue. I've not added any climate change policies here. We're not talking about the net zero target being met. This is India's power sector getting cleaned just because of, you remember those charts I showed you where solar and wind is becoming cheaper than coal? Because of that, in fact, you can see in this decade alone, you know, by 2030 itself, you see the power sector emissions flattening out. It's not becoming zero, it's not going down, and that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to bend that curve. But on the power sector side, we see that the emissions are flattening out. What about industry? What do you think is going to happen with the industry sector? No, this is just electricity generation. Yeah, this is, so the question was, is it taking into account uh, the growing output? Yeah, the output is increasing, the amount of electricity is growing, but the emissions from the electricity are staying flat because more and more of the electricity is coming from cleaner sources like wind and solar. And also it's becoming a little more efficient. Even the thermal power sources are kind of, you know, becoming a little more efficient in the future. 
So tell me what happens with industrial production. Flat? Similar? <laughs> huh? Goes down. Unfortunately, it goes up even faster than for the economy. So this is the real the catch, right? Uh, industrial processes, not those using energy, not using electricity, but industrial processes that burn fossil fuels, that produce cement, steel, using certain chemical reactions which we can't change that easily, those industrial processes are what are called hard to abate. Right? Those are the ones which are hard to decarbonize. Electricity is easier to kind of clean up by switching to renewables. But industry, you know, unless you find a different way of making steel, or you find a way to switch more and more into electricity, but for every industrial application you need, you can't use electricity. Sometimes you need high heat and you know, other sort of issues, so because of that. So uh, let's just see what else we can look at. Transport, anybody wants to take a guess? What happens with transport? Goes down. Goes down. What's the big source of transport emissions for India? The growing source of emissions from transport? Uh, <laughs> who, who has attended my talk? Someone's giving all the right answers. Is it you? Yeah, so that's, that's the interesting thing. So let's just look at uh, transport. Usually what people talk about is um, uh, cars, um, uh, aircraft, aviation, because that's what's, that's what's visible, right? Um, but if you look at the vehicle type, you see that light blue band in the middle? Yeah? That's actually heavy freight trucks. So it's the trucks on our road. And uh, a lot of the others are not causing that much of greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah? So that's also something quite interesting, that often when we think about what's causing climate change, or we often think about what are the, prob what are the solutions, we get quite um, caught up by some of the more obvious ones, and we lose, we miss out some of the easy solutions. Easy meaning that we don't have to wait for any futuristic technology. What's the solution? What's the alternative to trucks? It's railways. Right? We used to have a lot of our goods traffic going by railways, but it has decreased over the last few decades. If we could solve some of those um, you know, regulatory issues and you know, issues of convenience. So, but it doesn't have to wait for any futuristic technology to be invented. So with that, let's just try to move to um, this problem of trying to bend the curve, right? Let's just look at CO2, CO2 fur, yeah? And um, even though I painted a pretty rosy picture, you know, things are going okay in the power sector, but the emissions curve is going up, right? It's not actually coming down. So even after 2050, it continues to grow up. Now I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna challenge you to try to bend this curve by applying all of the solutions that you can think of. And what we're gonna do is on the left-hand side, you have all the sectors, you have electricity, industry, transport, you have buildings, for example, meaning the appliances that we use. Uh, we have agriculture, land use, and forestry. This model is not great with agriculture, land use, and forestry, but we'll still try, yeah? So let's just have, you know, from each side of the room, one kind of example of something to try out, and we'll see how much of an effect it has. So we'll start from there. Any ideas, any solutions that you want to try out? The, the problem to be solved is to bring that curve down. Anytime in, yeah, please go ahead. Forest sequestration, let's try to do that, yeah. Huh? Exports. Okay, that's a good one. Uh, but exports of what? Because before we export, we must be manufacturing it domestically. So export of? Cars. Yeah, okay. So sequestration first, let's just try. So we have, for example, afforestation and reforestation. Yeah, and of course we can't plant trees everywhere. There's a certain limit, but let's just try as much as possible. Let's just increase this to as much as we can. Let's let's try with 70%. What happens? The 70% target is for 2050. Yeah, and we're going to see what happens to CO2 emissions. It's come down pretty significantly. Now, of course, all of this you are not going to be able to plant everywhere. Uh, forests are already protected. You might need to plant trees outside of forests. So in urban areas, along the, uh, you know, the buns of farms, um, maybe in fact incentivize people to grow these trees 
all of that, right? So it's come down, but it's still not somehow bending down, right? It's just come down. Now, uh, you said reduce the manufacturing of uh, cars. Now, we don't have cars as a product over here, but let's see if we can put in something like steel, right? So we'll have to break it down to how do you do that? Um, not very sure how to do it. Let's see. Hmm. I'm going to try to put it in Alpand. Dave, any ideas? Ma material efficiency? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I substituting steel for, let's say, real steel or scrap metal. Right. So let's just try to do that. We'll just take steel and we'll say that we'll, I mean, this is a kind of proxy, right? This is not exactly what you're saying. But we'll try to say that we'll try to bring down the amount of material, the amount of steel that we are using, um, let's say 20%. Yeah? It had a little bit of effect. Let's try to increase it a little more. So the scale has changed a little bit. So, uh, so that's a good thing. Okay. Let's take a couple of options from this side of the room. Okay. So let's try to do that. So again, in transportation, what we want is that we want more electric vehicles to come in. And let's say by 2050, about half our vehicles will be electric. Yeah, does that sound, does that make sense? So that's built it. Do you think by 2050, all our vehicles will be electric? 80, 90%, let's go to 80%, yeah. What about hydrogen powered Let's try to do that, yeah, yeah. Yes. Absolutely right. Yeah. So exactly. Yes. So what we do is we try to have hydrogen vehicles coming in a little after 2025 or 2030, not immediately, because again, electric vehicles, you need the infrastructure put in place. You need the charging infrastructure. You, as you rightly said, the batteries have to be good enough. So for trucks, you can't have massive batteries right now. Uh, you would need fast charging for overnight charging of these trucks, you know, on their, on their long distance routes. But there would be disposal issues as well. But on hydrogen, uh, what we can do is we can have hydrogen in, for example, ships. Um, we could have it in some, to some extent in trucks as well. So what we do over here is we, um, you know, we have a little bit of, I mean, we have both electrification and hydrogen as, as an option. So for example, we have a hydrogen vehicle sales mandate and we can pick some of these like freight and let's just make it like maybe 10, 15%, yeah? Now that hasn't shifted the curve. Why is that? We've put in hydrogen into our vehicles. Let's, let's try to put in more, yeah? It's not shifting the curve too much. Why is it? Hydrogen. It's not green hydrogen, exactly. So right now the industry is using a lot of what is called gray hydrogen. It's produced from natural <laughs> gas. But the hydrogen has to come from uh, electrolysis from the use of renewable electricity. So that's also something that, that we need to do in order to make this. So one of the interesting things that this simulator shows you is that actions in one sector, like in the transport sector, say the transport ministry makes a decision, are not going to be by themselves sufficient. There has to be a matching action taken in some other industry in the power sector. So renewables has to come to make that hydrogen, and then that hydrogen that's manufactured has to be used by people in industry. So, sorry. So, if you go into the back of the model, which you can do. Um, so, for example, if you go to view the online guide, and you know you can download the model. You can, uh, for example, the entire documentation is available over here. Um, you can sort of look at the overview. You can see what's the data, what are the assumptions. You can see some of the cause. I mean, you can see the causal loop diagrams. The only thing is they're broken up because they're trying to show you each variable that's been used. But those of you who are comfortable with WinSim or Python, you can just download the whole thing in your system. You can change the equations. You can change the data set if you want to. And, and you can kind of just, just play around with it. What I'm showing you today is only the web interface, which is, uh, you know, which is just online, and it's meant for people who don't necessarily want to go and, and you know, recode everything. But yeah, absolutely, you can do that. Is 
I don't think so. I don't think so. That's very interesting. Um, no, I don't think there's already output like that. Yeah. So, um, so uh, you had talked about the uh, waste, right? So let's let me just kind of change that a little bit and take, for example, the um, um, material efficiency over here, which includes things like reuse, uh, repurposing, recycling, all of that. And you're absolutely right. It's not something that will happen by itself, right? But increasingly in India, some of the states that are making electric vehicle policies, like Bihar state where we are working, are also putting in place clauses for recycling of the battery waste. So solar, wind, uh, electric vehicle batteries, all of these are going to basically expire another 5, 8, 10, 15 years. And so already they are putting in place some clauses that there has to be responsible recycling or reuse. Um, I think we have time to put in place the entire ecosystem of, um, you know, of what is called a circular economy in a way that creates jobs. Uh, so I think there is time to do that. But if we, for example, have recycling, say, 25 to 30 percent of this, then we can try to bend that curve. But it's still not bending very much. Yeah? We, we want it to become net zero, right? We don't want to wait till 2070. That's 2070 so far. How do we make it? So a couple of more ideas, yeah? Emissions trading, okay, all right. Would you want to just uh, say, um, because a lot of people are, uh, I mean, not very happy, not fans of emissions trading, but I'm an economist, so I'm gonna be very happy to put in place what is called a carbon tax. So if an economist trading and taxation are two sides of the same coin, it basically, yeah? Okay, sure, I'll do that. So basically, when we talk about emissions trading, we put a cap on the economy as a whole, yeah? put a cap on the entire industrial system and say that the total emissions must come down. That cap is very important because without that cap, it's all very loose. When you put that cap, where exactly in the economy the emissions reduction happens for CO2 is not important because CO2 is a gas that just gets mixed into the atmosphere. So it's not like sulfur dioxide or you know, air pollution where it really matters where that emissions reduction is happening. So once you have a cap, you can let people do more or less than their individual targets and to trade between themselves. And the advantage of that is that more emissions reduction can happen where it's cheaper and there can be an economic gain to the system as a whole, a cost benefit to the system as a whole. So it actually encourages people to do more. Why I said that trading and taxation is the same thing for me as an economist is because the result is that a ton of CO2 gets a value. It gets a price. You can think of it as a penalty. You can think of it as a price, a value that you, know, you can trade now with somebody else. Or you can think of it as a tax that might actually bring revenue to the government. So I'm going to actually take your example, your suggestion, and implement it in the form of a carbon tax. Yeah? So let's see how to do that. So now this is a cross-sector option, carbon tax. And you know India already has a sort of carbon tax? Does anybody know that? What it's called? Madhul knows because she writes about it. The coal cess, exactly. So already there is a cess on coal, so every uh, unit of coal that's, that's mined or produced, there is a kind of price on it. Um, is there an option for yes, yes, many companies you'll be surprised to know do have internal carbon pricing. So, yeah? In this particular model, uh, no. In this particular model, so this is not, you know, it doesn't let you go into each company and say this is, but yeah, in, in the real world right now, many companies like the Godrages, the Mahindras, you know, a lot, lot of these large companies do have an internal carbon price now for the last 10 years. They initially started with something like $10 per ton of CO2, which is just to kind of get that into their balance sheets, right? Just to kind of understand. So if you're a manager in a company and you need to make a choice of, say, buying this material or using that unit or, you know, manufacturing in this way, you don't just take into account the cost of the labor, the capital, the machines, the transport. You also take into account the cost of the carbon. So when you get to choose between something that is more fossil fuel intensive, more renewable intensive, that actually figures into your decision making as a business manager. And now a lot of these companies have actually gone up towards almost $50 per ton of CO2, which is a reasonably good price. Hmm? No, no, in India as well, in India. It's an internal carbon price, so all of them may not be talking about it a lot. But yeah, some of them, some of the pioneering leaders, um, steel companies actually. And the, and the reason they are being driven to do this 
uh, is because Europe is now coming up with a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Europe has had an emissions trading system now for 20 years, and now they're saying that that level of taxation should also be applied to any imports of that commodity that are coming into Europe. So because of that, any Indian company that wants to uh, sell steel to Europe must also take into account that its carbon intensity must be on par. So many of them are actually taking on actions that are not greenwashing. They're actually quite internal and they're very business driven, right? They're not sustainability only driven. It just makes hard economic sense, hard business sense to them. So, so I'm going to put a carbon tax over here. And we start with the coal cess that's already in place. And I'm going to try to increase it to say something like 2,500 rupees by, yeah? Let's see what happens. That's, that works. Now, why does that work? Because it, cover, it hits every sector of the economy. Now, in some cases, that might not be such a great thing. Imagine if farmers or poorer households their electricity cost goes up as a result of this carbon price. What would you do? How would you solve that? Any thoughts? Hmm? Refund, them for Refund them, yeah. You could recycle, you could redistribute. And people always ask me, how would you redistribute? Do you have any thoughts on TBT? TBT? Direct, benefits Direct benefits transfer. transfer. Uh, Correct. Correct. So you could actually put money back into the accounts if you knew who the poorer households were. If you, for example, landless farmers or uh, you know other types of ways in which you could you could increase, for example, the MNRG wage rate. Um, there are many many different like this you know Kisan kind of schemes that you have. There are many ways in which you could do that. Uh, in other countries which already have a carbon tax, there are usually two ways of recycling the revenue. In Canada, they do give money back to households, but in other countries, like in some of the US states, they actually put money in an R&D fund for low carbon technologies. So it also kind of drives innovation. So there are many different ways. Uh, in Scandinavia in particular, there's a lot of trust in the way government works, in the processes and mechanisms for recycling the revenue. So they, so they do it that way. But there are many different ways in which, which you could do it around the world. But I'm going to get a little kind of excited about this and see if I could increase it a little more and see what happens. So the scale is changing, yeah? so don't be surprised that it's jumping up. It's now kind of, but, but look at the shape of the curve. We need more, more suggestions. I'm running out of time. My talk time is almost getting over. Okay, we can do that. We'll take one more example. Yeah? Okay, let's try. So agriculture, forestry. Again, this model is not great with agriculture and forestry, but we'll try. Any other thoughts? Huh? Buildings. Buildings. Okay, yeah? Okay, let's try to do all of these things. Okay, first, we're going to try to make that hydrogen green, yeah? And we're going to try to make industry use some of that green hydrogen. So let's go over here electrification and hydrogen. And I'm going to say that by 2050, half of the industrial fossil fuel use should either be electrified, yeah? So either you switch to electricity, which is renewables, or, uh, I mean, we haven't yet made it renewables, right? It's electricity. Or you try to use hydrogen. So I'm going to try to do that. Yeah, good, all right. Now, I'm going to try to make that electricity become, let's see, as much as, shall we, shall we make all our hydrogen green by 2050? Yeah? Let's, oh, someone's very conservative. <laughs> okay, nice. All right, we'll do that. But let's just see what's happening over here, right? Our electricity is still not as green as it can be. So I'm going to set a kind of mandate, yeah? I'm going to go into the electricity sector. I've not banned any coal power plants or anything, nothing like that I've done yet. But I'm going to set a carbon-free electricity standard. Again, India already has these renewable purchase obligations. So every state is required to meet around, it was initially around 20% odd of its electricity from, from renewables. Uh, the plan is to make that 40% pretty soon. Um, but let's, let's just see if we can make it something like 60 or 70%. By 2050, remember? By 2050, there's, there's st still time. No, that didn't do very much. You know why it didn't do very much? Because the, remember that power sector curve? 
70% is happening anyway. It's happening anyway because of economic reasons. So you don't need additional mandate. Let's just try to make it 90%. And you see that bend that happened over there? So it kind of went up to what was economically feasible and then tried to do some more. So let's just, I'm gonna just try to do a little bit more of your agriculture and industry and then I'm gonna to try to wrap this up, yeah? So for example, we can have cropland and rice measures. So that's you know, something like your natural farming and all of that. Let's see whatever we can do over here. It didn't change anything, do you know why? Because this is a CO2 curve and what that does is methane, right? So we have to look at CO2E, which we have a line for. And what we also have, in fact, is other gases. So for example, SOX, yeah? SOX also comes down. We look at, for example, PM10. PM10 also comes down with that, right? So it's not just CO2, but other gases also that get reduced. Now, let's have a look at, um, I'm gonna just close all of this. And we haven't, uh, we have, we've, we've done a pretty good job, right? We have reached almost you know, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 tons of CO2 by 2050. And the trajectory that we seem to be on uh, seems to indicate that by 2070 we'll actually become net zero, yeah, or close to zero. So I think you've all done a very good job. I think what I will do now is just try to show you our solution, right? What my colleagues try to put together, taking into account not just what is the potential, the technical potential, but what would be the impact on the economy. We don't want jobs to be lost. We don't want India's you know, imports to increase or import costs to increase. We don't want the revenue, the tax revenue to come down. So let's just take a look at that and I'll discard these changes and look at CO2. So this is what we got as a result of a combination of factors. And if you ask me what were the solutions that led to all of this, you get a rainbow of options in different sectors. And the colors of the actions tell you which sector they're from. So the blue was the buildings one. I think one of you wanted to look at buildings. Uh, the brownish ones are in the power sector. The green ones are in the agriculture. But if you lay out these actions in terms of cost, from the cheapest to the most expensive, you find a number of actions on the left-hand side that are negative cost, right? They're going below the uh, x-axis. What does it mean to have a negative cost option? It pays back. So a lot of these actions save energy, which means saving money, and it just pays back for itself. So all of the efficiency actions, all of the railways, mode shifting, all of that, it just pays for itself. Same with buildings. Anything that you do when you switch to more efficient appliances pays back for itself. Let's just see what happens with jobs and GDP, yeah? And we find that as a result of the uh, options that we chose, the jobs actually increase. And I'm going to show you later on a slide because when you go into this model, you can go into each sector and see whether the job's being gained and lost. This picture just gives you an aggregate picture. And we see that a lot of jobs are being created, one, in the electricity sector. And that's because you're setting up a lot of new renewable electricity, a lot of hydrogen electrolysis, all of these kinds of um, uh, equipment. There are jobs that are created in the industry sector because you have more manufacturing of electric vehicles, more manufacturing of all kinds of other things as well, which are feeding into this, um, this economy. Uh, it's not a huge amount, right? You can see over there. In fact, if I take um, exactly only the direct uh, jobs change, uh, but even here you can see that it is something like thousands of jobs, uh, almost a, billion, a million jobs created over this, over this period. Uh, but of course, this is a rosy picture. I'm gonna show you after this. We're gonna close this and we're gonna go into some of this detail. But what we have done is we have made sure that that jobs line is not going down. It is not going negative. And it's the same with if you take, for example, uh, the change in GDP. Here as well, the change in GDP is marginally positive, but it's positive. It's not, it's not negative. Um, we can also see things in other sectors of the economy. So for example, we can look at um, the impact on water. And water becomes important in the power sector because our coal power plants use a lot of water for cooling. Um, most of India's coal power plants use fresh water. Only a few which are located near the coast are using seawater 
for, for cooling. So as you slowly phase down the amount of coal, and we've not phased it out, but we have slowly phased it down, the water that is used is also reduced. So just to give you an idea of what happens in the electricity sector, because I skipped that a little bit, I'm going to just give you a comparison of the business as usual. And the band that you see below the red line, it's not showing up as a color, it's kind of fading into the background, but that's coal. So in the business as usual, current trends continue. The amount of coal electricity capacity that we have today, around 200 gigawatts, it stays through the future. And that's why your power sector line, which we saw at the beginning, was not going down. It was staying flat, it was not increasing, but it was not going down. So that's your coal that is there. Yellow, you can see solar. Light blue, you can see wind. It's increasing in the business as usual scenario. But in the net zero 2070 scenario, it has to increase even more, and that coal has to slowly phase down. So we're not getting rid of it, but we're trying to make sure that more and more renewable energy comes into the system. And that's the only way to actually bend the emissions curve. Uh, in addition to all of the efficiency improvements and all of the different ideas that you gave. The underlying idea is that the electricity sector must become cleaner. So as we do this, the water use also goes down, and there's a saving of something like 30 trillion liters of water from the power sector alone as we do it. We can also look at what happens to human health. Remember, we saw that uh, there are various um, SOX, NOx, CO2, CO uh, particulate matter goes down, and this shows you the avoided premature deaths that increases uh, uh, as a result of these cleaner actions. So what's good from a climate perspective is also good from a local environmental perspective. And I'll end with just a few slides over here. So all of those uh, actions that I showed, all of them, of course, have a cost. They have a capital cost. Even the ones that pay for themselves, they pay for themselves over time. And the initial investment has to be made by somebody. And so this is the calculation which has been done by downloading. You can do that. You can download all the spreadsheets from the same web interface. And you can add them up, which is what I've done to make the simple Excel sheet. But we find that in the initial years, because we're not depending on a lot of futuristic technologies, the investment cost that's needed is something somewhere around, say, $20 million a year, uh, $20 billion a year, and then it goes up to something like $200 billion a year, right? So over the period of the next 30 years, it comes to something like $3 trillion. That's a huge amount of money. But a lot of this money has to come from the private sector. It's a lot of private investment. Um, there will be still some sectors, some, like for example, electric charging infrastructure, which we tend to depend on the government for. We tend to think of transport infrastructure, electricity infrastructure as public expenditure. There will also be other actions required, like the jobs that we spoke about, they'll require people to be trained. And the carbon tax that we spoke about, that money will have to be uh, redistributed. So there will be a large number of development expenditures that the government will have to undertake. Not everything can come from the private sector. And at the same time, what's happening over here is if you see that red line that's going down, that's the fossil fuel tax revenue that the government currently gets. It gets about a quarter of its tax revenue from oil and gas. Yeah? So as we phase out the use of oil and gas vehicles and we start bringing in these electric vehicles, the government's tax revenue also is going to take a hit. So we need some other form of tax. Here, in this example, we've used that carbon tax revenue you know, that, uh, that we put. And we say that that actually compensates the, the balance in the government's revenue uh, records. But it could be some other kind of tax. It could be a corporate tax. It could be a tax on renewable energy. It could be a tax on electric vehicles. It doesn't have to be a, a carbon tax or whatever makes sense. But there will be a need to, uh, to sort of think about this a little bit. And in terms of jobs, as you can see over here, if you break it down to the different types of jobs, uh, the line which is going down, the blue one, is the mining jobs, right? So coal mining, but also other minerals. That is going to go down because, um, you know, that's, those are the kinds of actions that we've introduced. And, uh, but on the manufacturing side, utilities, construction, services, which kind of are as a spin-off, right? If you have more industry, then there's more services to support that, trade, retail, restaurants, all of these come up. And um, uh, right now, what this depends on is India's input-output table. Uh, those of you who are looking at economics can sort of see some of the work that is being done on that. That input-output table also needs to be updated, and then you might get slightly uh, more updated results. Um, I'm going to now end with, a, with just a few uh, slides, and then we'll have some time for discussion. Um, which is that there are spatial differences. Of course, many of you will point this out. So the black dots are where the coal power plants are, 
and the blue dots are where the wind power plants are. And the wind potential is in the south and the west, so it can't come up, it can't one-on-one -on -one substitute in each location. So that is something which we all talk about, just transition. That is, there is going to be a need not just on the technical side for electricity to be transferred from where it is generated to where it is needed, but also the jobs to be also um, created, maybe other kinds of jobs. So where coal mines or coal power plants are being closed down, there will be a need for, say, restoration-based jobs or other kinds of food processing MSMEs to be set up. In Ethiopia, there is one very interesting example. The electricity utility in Ethiopia, when it set a target for um, increasing its renewable electricity, it also set a target for having uh, jobs for women in the electricity utility. But there weren't enough women who had the skills, who had the training to get these jobs. So the electricity utility actually went one step further and it tied up with their education ministry, with their university system, and they created internships, fellowships, and scholarships for women to enter into science, technology, engineering kind of fields. And so this is something that is a pretty interesting, it's a Twitter handle as well as a website, Ethiopian Women in Energy. And they have tried to take on the entire system of not just setting a target, but actually making sure that women get those jobs. Right here in Karnataka, they follow the Twitter handle of Uma Mahadevan Das Gupta, who is uh, the, I think, additional chief secretary for the renewable energy, uh, sorry, Panchayati Raj Department, rural development Panchayati Raj Department. So um, they, for example, in the waste management sector, when there are um, waste management vehicles that are being sent around in order to make that process more efficient and systematic, they're also training women from these uh, panchayats to become drivers of those auto tippers. So that's another way of making sure that the climate change kind of actions that are taken are also taking into account how there can be additional social benefits created. This is a picture from Jharkhand. Uh, again, this is a video that you can look up on YouTube. And uh, there are food processing units that are being set up where SAG, women SAGs are given money in order to use renewable energy. In this case, it is for the rice mill or the ragi processing mill, but it uses solar power to run. And the reason is that it gives them reliable electricity and it also helps them to save costs. This is an example from Assam, where it is actually a cold storage unit that has been set up where, again, the woman, uh, women's SAG, they use it to store potatoes so, so that they can you know, get the price at the right time, take the produce to the market at the right time. And also, they even rent it out to others who are not members of their SHGs. So there are many, many applications of decentralized renewable energy that are being tried out all over the country. On the um, uh, sort of slightly flip side of it, uh, does anybody know what this map is of? Usually we see this map of the night lights of, um, you know, of the planet and it's kind of, does anybody know what this is? Energy resources, yeah? It looks like that, no? Anybody else? You're on the right track, but what kind of energy resources? Renewable energy resources, yeah, but uh, then Africa should also have sunlight, and I don't know why Europe has so much, yeah? Emissions, um, yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> it, there seems to be some correlation, but no. Actually, this is just showing you where all the solar plants in the world are located. Right? So every yellow dot is one solar installation. And this map has been put together with remote sensing, satellite sort of analysis, yeah? And this is a um, sort of paper in nature. There's also a blog, you can look, about, look at it. Um, but if you look at the map for India, right? There's so much of solar that is already there. Good, right? It sounds like a good thing. But what was this land where the solar is coming up? Does anybody know? Huh? Grasslands, forests. Forests maybe not, but grasslands, yeah? Common lands, yeah. Actually, 70% of it is agricultural land. It's cropland. So, uh, farmer. I mean, of course, we read stories about you know uh, many from di many different parts of the country, but a lot of this was uh, farmers who are um, uh, finding it very hard to make a living from dry land, rain-fed agriculture, which is you know so subject to the vagaries of the weather. So, um, this is a picture. So, we've done a study in Pawagada Solar Park, which is just nearby. And what we find, of course, is that uh, in this case, the farmers are not selling their land, they're leasing their land. So in a way, it is a good option for farmers who are struggling to make an income from farming. Uh, but there are many 
outcomes of this, right? There is more migration that happens to the villages because now farming is no longer an option. But another thing, and this is also true for the grasslands case, is that even livestock rearing becomes actually uh, you know, out of bounds. So now there is actually many different examples from the US, from Australia, from UK, of what is called solar grazing. That is, if you could just raise the height of the solar panels a little bit and keep a little more gap between the solar panels, then you could allow sheep to, to graze. In fact, one particular farm you know, so says that it employs the sheep to keep the grass under control instead of doing it through a mechanized way. So this is what is being called agri-photovoltaics. And other examples are of putting kind of more vertical solar panels on tree buns. Uh, but this is something definitely that would be a good kind of option to consider for the future if, um, you know, if you could have a coexistence of different types of livelihoods. Uh, on wind, and this is really, I think, my last slide. Uh, on wind, there are again, it is something that that is little, uh, you know, better in terms of land, uh, the use of land. Uh, but a lot of our prime wind power spots were already occupied about 15, 20 years ago when the first wave of wind power investment happened. Since then, there's been a lot of technological improvement in wind turbines. They've become bigger, they've become more efficient, but those older wind turbines are still standing. So if we could bring those down and put up the newer ones, this is what is called repowering wind, and the Tamil Nadu government and some others actually now have specific policies for this. And the other option is to start thinking about offshore wind, which is on the sea, which is very expensive right now, and you need to bring in uh, a lot of new kinds of capital. It's risky, so you need to bring in different layers of capital public as well as private. So that's the end of my presentation in terms of um, some of the examples of action that are happening already around the world. Uh, it's not to mean that it is easy. In fact, if you remember that wedge diagram, that rainbow of options, it is actually quite difficult. It will take action in almost every sector. But the lesson that I take away from it is that whichever sector you're going to be working in, there is an op opportunity to choose a low carbon option, a climate friendly option, over an alternative conventional fossil fuel option. Whether you're an architect, whether you're working in retail, whether you're you know, going to be designing our cities, or whether you're going to be working with farmers, there's always an option by which you can do the low carbon transition in a way that also brings social benefits. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, happy to take any questions. So thank you very much uh, for the uh, very interesting talk. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll have some time, about uh, maybe 15 minutes, uh, to interact, uh, you know, with the, with the audience. So we'll, we'll take questions. So what we'll do, um, uh, whoever has question, you know, can basically come come over here to the mic, and then you know, can uh, start. But before we go to the audience, uh, I have several questions, <laughs> but because I, I don't want to take you know like much time, but. I just want to ask one question. The first thing is, you know, it's a wonderful tool. It's like you are, uh, you guys are giving all the power to the to, to everybody, right? Because creating the interface, you know, to the to the model where people can play with, uh, you know, different scenarios. Uh, so, it's just one question from the top of my head: that how how are you planning on using this this tool uh, to influence policies in 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 a you know like a, in the Indian sector? So you can, you can take. Yeah, I mean, uh, our job as a, as a research institution is just to put uh, analysis out in the public domain. So we believe in open data, we publish our work, we get it peer reviewed. And one of the uh, purposes of this tool is to also tell you that there is no one known future, right? These are all scenarios. Correct, yeah. So your vision of what the world will be may be very different from mine. Uh, what this tool lets you do is actually explore all of these different scenarios. So when you say try to influence policy, I wouldn't even be able to say, you know, with certainty that this is the direction or right. this is how. Yeah. So what we can do is, is to inform. Uh, we can put this analysis out there. We can illustrate some of the synergies, some of the win-win options, and actually say very transparently what are the assumptions under which these are holding and what are the trade-offs. So as you can see from some of my subsequent slides, the spatial dimension or the gender dimension is not captured in this tool. Right? Right, the tool right. only looks yeah. at the economy yeah. as an aggregate. Yeah. So, so I wouldn't actually say one tool should be the basis of, uh, of you know, policy great. making, yeah. but it all has to be taken together. But our way of doing it is to publish research and to try to do more interactions like this. And, uh, and yeah, to make it... That's great. Actually, one, another thing that you, know, you uh, I think it just showed you know, in response to a question, uh, or 
that there is an option to download the, uh, the model uh, for the people who want to play with it. Maybe even just you know improve on it, right? That's okay. right. Yeah. So uh, actually, this model was first developed by a company, by a consultancy in the U.S. called Energy Innovation. So if you go to their website, if you go to this, you can also go and look at the model that they have developed for the U.S. and for many states in the U.S. And um, each model is slightly different, of course. The Indian model has been adapted by our team for the Indian data. Uh, but there are many other models out there as well. Uh, in fact, right here in Bangalore, C-STEP has its Safari model. You had the talk by Jaya yeah, yeah, Sundi yeah. on Safari Futures. I think that very much follows the same approach. There are other organizations as well. Terry had the Markel model, which is a very bottom-up model, very painstakingly identifying each fuel, each technology, you know, each cook stove, and you know, all of those technologies. Um, the CW, which uses the GCAM model. So there are many models, and the, I think the difficult part for a policymaker is when these models use different methods and give different answers. Yes. Which one is right? right. Uh, that is actually a choice that is, that is a difficult one, and all that a model can do is be transparent in its assumptions right. and, uh, you know, and make yeah. it and in, not in a black box. In climate science, you know, we are probably coming to a consensus when we are ensemble modeling, right? Yes. It's kind of you know, aggregated out. So yeah, that might be something you know might be coming out. Anyway, great. Yeah, thank you. So I think uh, I I want to open up uh, uh, the, um, the the questions. Uh, please say your name and if you want to say you know what your uh, affiliation is. Yep. And yeah, keep the questions short. Hi, uh, I'm Ravi. I'm a bookseller and uh, I also network actively for uh, sustainability. I make some comics and uh, I get exposed to a lot of different things. One thing which uh, is not. Uh, it's like the elephant which is not even in the room is uh, tidal energy. Okay. It's, uh, I mean, I wanted to, the question is uh, from a policy perspective and probably the next time around you'll do your update for your model also, it could be included. Because unlike solar and wind, you have it 24 hours a day. And uh, there are different uh, technologies from different uh, countries, companies, uh, which uh, give 24 hours a day energy green, clean. Yeah, that's the question. Thank you. He's absolutely yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good point. Um, and there's also, for example, many countries in Africa, for example, have a lot of geothermal electricity. So if you see their electricity mix, many of the African countries already have 90% renewables because they have all of these options. But if you see the scale of the electricity that's there for these countries, it's like a fraction of, of the scale that we need. So I think all these options, uh, nuclear is also another elephant in the room that I didn't mention, but I think all of these will be required. It's a model. So model can be improved. You know, it can be like different models can be developed. Yeah. It's good, sir, Sandra. Yeah, thank you. Next question. Hi, my name is Sabina, and I work as an innovation facilitator. My question was a little lateral, and since you were put in, putting an economist lens on the whole thing, and you mentioned carbon trading, uh, could there be a possible future scenario where, you know, uh, one is, you know, carbon trading goes the way of speculation and, you know, how we trade uh, today in stocks and things, and speculation and hedging, and it becomes an abstraction of the real scenario. That's one. But then the second potential is, could it also land up being a great unifier? Because today we see India and other countries in the global south really contributing very small to carbon emissions. But could there be potential for this to be like a new economic uh, you know, model in some way, like a, a unified global currency? I don't know. I was just thinking, could that carbon emission reductions be the new gold, you know, for pegging of, of currencies and things like that. So just curious to know your perspective It's all on down that. in early, your economic. <laughs> uh, not really. This is all very new economics for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, on speculation, I think very much it is already entering, entering into, you know, when, when there are um, uh, uh, energy exchanges. So in Europe, particularly, you know, when the Ukraine war started, you could see the prices shoot up in the EU emissions trading system. And in fact, a few years ago, there was this, you know, 100 euros per ton of CO2 was like this golden mark, you know, like the psychological threshold. And that was reached uh, last year, which shows that things are getting serious. Uh, so I think uh, any time that there is value in anything, there will be futures trading, there will be speculation around it. Um, so I'm sure people will make money wherever there is money to be made. Uh, in terms of the unifying standard, again, yes, that is one of the things which we, which we actually talk about, that is a price on carbon uh, does make it a kind of, um, you know, like for example, right now we have a perform achieve trade scheme. It's an energy trading system that India already has. Uh, 
we also have what was called the clean development mechanism, which were projects that were started 10, 20 years ago. Uh, but these are different commodities, right? They're both saving energy, saving CO2, but these don't speak to each other, these systems. So something like a carbon tax would actually make everything comparable. So it is very much the idea that you're speaking about, not just within the country, but comparable with other markets. Um, but yes, the point that you raised about whether India's carbon tax should be as high as that of a developed country, given its historical low contributions, that is also a very valid point. So, uh, so definitely in this um, EU carbon border adjustment mechanism, there is a fight back, a pushback against it, that why should Indian commodities be subject to the same level? And surely there should be some kind of adjustment in the you know, uh, imports from a developing country versus a developed country. So I think in the next few years, we'll see a lot of this evolving actually in front of our eyes. And there is an opportunity even to feed into some of this because there are often public calls for consultation um, that anybody can actually give their comments to. So yeah, <laughs> it's exciting times. Yeah, thank you. So as of now, like again, I'm asking it without having any background on it. So how do you think like, you know, to what Percentage, you think the carbon market is matured now, or you know, how much more it's going to mature? Like two. I think it's just started. Yeah. Uh, the early carbon markets that have been around for a while are two. One is the EU emissions trading system, which has been there for a while. The, uh, there, they had an early phase of learning what was called grandfathering of the permits. So maybe that cap that I spoke about was not that tight in the beginning. But now it has become quite matured. Uh, over time, they have also expanded to include more and more industries. The other mature system is in certain states of the United States, so California on the one hand, and then the northeastern states on the other. They've had these systems for a while. So there again, there's a lot of learning from that. But China came up with a market, I think, a year or two ago, only for its power sector. That's a new one. Korea has one. So there are many emerging markets as well. And the Indian market, I think, has the advantage of having had an energy trading market before. Not a carbon trading market, but pretty much the same thing. Again, we've had more and more industries being included into this. Uh, we've had a penalty. There's been lots of trainings. There are lots of energy auditors. Uh, so we have a lot of the system in place. And uh, I, I, I feel that the carbon market can be kind of um, can learn from this prior experience. Yeah. But definitely a long yeah. way to go. Yeah, all right. Um, yeah, any other question? You just want to? Hi, uh, my name is Kovid, and I'm a consultant who's just learning about uh, sustainability as an area. So since we are talking about carbon markets, my question was also related. Uh, so let's say what would be the feasibility and the impact if we allow carbon emission offset expenses as a part of CSR? I wanted to know your views on that. Um, I, <laughs> okay, since you asked for my views, I'll give you my views. I think these are two separate things. In fact, I would say there are three separate things, right? So in an emissions trading system, like a carbon market, the way I described it, there was this nice tight cap and the companies within that or under that cap traded with each other. I didn't actually talk about offsets, which is to buy things from outside the system, like planting of trees, the sequestration that we spoke about. And that is what is in the news a lot. So now, for example, even if you buy a plane ticket, sometimes the airline website asks you, do you want to offset your emissions? And the way they do that is that they promise to invest in some kind of forest project or say mango plantation somewhere. And you know, they, they kind of assure you that those trees will not be cut down and you can go make your flight to the US and come back. Uh, that offset becomes a little tricky because, you know, what is that land? Who is benefiting from that money? All of those issues. The third part of it is the CSR, which is actually meant to be for certain other social reasons, right? Uh, I think mixing up all these three things risks the account, uh, risks double counting. That is, you know, something that, that you don't actually end up doing something new. You're actually just putting old wine in new bottles. So my uh, thought would be that at least in the early stages, these should all be very clear. Uh, clear and separate, so that we can we can count honestly how much more is being done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time. Probably a couple of questions. Uh, anyone? Yeah. Sure. Hi. Uh, my name is Anusha, uh, and I work as a learning designer. So I was really fascinated to see all the numbers that you shared. It was uh, you know a lot to do with industries, and you also speak about government policies and also. I'm curious to know uh, what are some changes that individuals can make that can make you know move that graph also a little bit. 
Um, I think um, I think there are a number of things. In fact, all of the examples that I showed actually can be broken down to one individual's um, contribution. So when it's building energy appliances, you know, you, all of the things about looking at standards, buying more efficient appliances, uh, green building materials, saving electricity, of course. But I'll give a couple of examples of things which, which can have quite a massive impact. One is air travel. Uh, there was a study that was done a few years ago about um, what were called, you know, super elite frequent flyers, uh, you know, which cause the maximum bulk of emissions. In fact, that study found that even in rich countries, even in developed countries, half the population has never actually set foot on a plane. So uh, those of us who are traveling are actually, you know, like uh, rich country people. And it found that these um, frequent flyers are actually causing the bulk of emissions. And you know, what was the definition of a frequent flyer? It was someone who takes one long haul flight in a year and also maybe one short haul flight a month. And, and we do that for work, all of us, uh, you know, uh, and maybe for our holidays or something like that, right? So it's not, it's, it's not unthinkable, right? Uh, there may be people who have their private jet sets and uh, jets and they're the ones who very rightly get a lot of the, uh, you know, the flack. Uh, but all of us also are contributing quite a lot to air travel emissions. And the interesting thing about air travel emissions is it is not counted in the account of any country. If today I fly from India to London, uh, those emissions are not counted in India's greenhouse gas inventory, they're not counted in UK's greenhouse gas inventory by convention. So the International Civil Aviation actually has a 2050 target and it's not easy to replace those aviation fuel and all of that, right? So, so it is a tricky one. So I think that is one individual action that we can all take. I know it's difficult because there's always like a, you know, very good reason for work, very good reason for education, very good reason for, uh, you know, family. Uh, but if we can cut back on international travel in particular, that would be a major, major uh, individual action that we, we can do. And it's not... <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. See, I, I, mean, I see. I, I really like your question, actually, because mm -hmm. it really opens up another side of the tool, right. right? So as I said, it's like, you know, the tool is giving power. It's kind of handing right. over power to the people right. at an individual level, right. even though it doesn't have that maybe impact analysis on an individual level. Yeah. The more people play with it, right, then they can see the, the different sectors and different scenarios, mm -hmm. correct? That kind of connects back to, you know, what you were saying, saying that, you know, like making our self-conscious yeah. about our actions, yeah. right? And maybe like, you know, just, 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 just say that maybe... So I wanted to actually give another yeah. example about that, which is about food loss. You know, globally, 40% of food is wasted between the farm and the plate. And in India also, there's a lot of food wastage that happens at the farm stage because, you know, there isn't warehousing, there isn't cold chain uh, infrastructure. Um, many, many farmers don't have information about markets, so they don't know when they'll get the right price. Um, all of that. Uh, there was a study that somebody did for Bangalore and for the 500 wedding halls in Bangalore and found that something like a thousand tons of food is wasted in these wedding halls wow. in a year. Yeah, this was counted. And this is high calorie food. And if you uh, actually feed people an average meal, you can pay, uh, you can actually use, this is the equivalent of 26 million people getting an average Indian meal. So again, when you have rest, eat out in restaurants, have your weddings. Uh, we don't have to have this show of generosity. We can sort of try to make sure even in our own fridges, and this is something that we are trying to do, make sure that food is not wasted. This is something that not only has a carbon or methane sort of uh, footprint, it also has a water footprint. It has major implications for nutrition in our country. But the point that you made about um, uh, solar electricity is really important. India is meeting a lot of its utility scale solar targets, but it's not being able to meet its rooftop solar targets. And this is again a combination of a number of things information, you know, the uh, administrative process for the household of actually going through this. Also the ability of the electricity utility to pay people and to lose its paying customers. So states like Gujarat have done a good job, but other states can also catch up on, on incentivizing households to, to have rooftop solar. There is no stress uh, to individuals from the government or anybody? No, actually there is in some states. Electricity often tends to be like a state-specific kind of promotional thing. So I think in Karnataka, we, I think there's a lot more opportunity, a lot more potential to do more. But yeah. All right. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think we have time for one more question. Thank you for that great talk, first of all. Um, my name like is that. Tanuj. Right. Um, 
uh, your carbon tax, he says, right? The idea that I want to say is that even in Europe, when you do something like this, first thing you try to do is offshore to a economy where you know the costs are not so high, right? And uh, or even with garbage or whatever, you put it there. Um, the idea that I want to ask you is that in this country, when you say carbon tax, what are you looking at? How is enforcement going to happen? You say there are auditors, etc. But what really are we measuring? Just energy input? Are we measuring anything else? Um, that's that's part one of that question. Second, you say all of this, you know, that it requires capital investment. The second is uh, India is cash flow sensitive, right? If even if I give you something that is long term um, good for you, but it costs you more today, like buying an EV, people are not going to buy. So in those transition plans, uh, yes, private investment is required. Yes, financing will be important. But what solutions do you see in that reality where you can, you know, like solar, like you say, for some people is cheaper today. But on a lifetime basis, right? Not not today, today. I still have to cough up that money today somehow, find financing, find something to do that. So given those scenarios, what makes sense to you? And, sec and, and I want to understand the carbon tax a little better. And how do you actually enforce in a country with low state capacity? Because pollution controls also haven't done so well, right? Yeah. So these are all very valid questions. In terms of how the carbon tax will be operationalized, there are two or three ways in which to do it. One is through having an emissions trading system, as somebody said. So you could have the perform achieve trade system, which is an energy trading system, and expand its scope so that the trading happens not in energy terms, but in carbon terms. So whatever is being traded in energy, you convert it into a carbon currency. And India, actually, the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha passed an amendment to the Electricity uh, Act last year. So the Rajya Sabha passed it in December, which now brings in, actually, an Indian carbon market. Right. Um, there is a kind of regulatory uh, setup that is there. It's something that you'll see happening over the next couple of years. Uh, so that's one. The other is the carbon tax, which is, uh, you know, we have a coal cess already. The revenue from the coal cess has more recently been going into actually uh, compensating for the GST tax. So again, you could have, you could expand that coal cess, make it applicable to more activities, and, you know, it works as a, as a tax. But you're absolutely right that, the, that for each of these new instruments, there would need to be an entire kind of capacity built to monitor, um, you know, to compensate in some cases, that redistribution part of it is actually very important. Um, on terms of the capital, you're absolutely right, and this is relevant at two scales. One is at the scale of individuals. If a household, for example, wants to get the upfront capital, like a lakh and a half per megawatt, to get a rooftop system, it needs to be able to, you know, to actually go through all of that process. Uh, at, a, at a much larger scale, um, any investor, any foreign investor, um, would actually get to choose between different geographies, Africa, India, uh, maybe somewhere else, Europe. And there are more and more, there's growing evidence that the cost of capital for these developing countries is many times that of the cost of the same kind of capital, the same investment in a developed country. So there is a lot of now discussion happening. In June, you will see this finance summit happening in France, which is actually being co-hosted by India. Uh, which is all about reforming the financial system and making sure that more private money flows in and more of the public money also kind of supports this. So you're absolutely right. There are many, many issues, but, but they are now being talked about more and more. That is, none of these scenarios that we are showing, none of them will actually happen unless the capital flows. Thank you. I think we'll take the last question in here. Yeah. I am Balaji. I am uh, currently pursuing my master's. So my question is, as we discussed to the presentation, uh, we have saw the cause and effects basically. So my question is, how far it's wise to see the uh, environment discourse in va economical vantage point, based on the rational choice theoretical perspective? And uh, another question is, and we are not taking the intersubjectivity in the policy making. So what's your view on it? I'm afraid I'm perhaps not the best person to answer this question. I think what I take away from your question is two things. One is that everything is not as neat as the charts that I drew, right? There are political economy issues. Economics itself is having a lot of revolution right now, right? There's a lot of rethinking about economics, the rational assumption, uh, the rationality assumption. There's also another new kind of uh, trend that is coming into economics, which is recognizing that technology diffusion, learning, innovation, all this also happens sometimes faster and doesn't actually get captured in models like this one. Here we have tried a little bit, but there's much more. So I would say it goes both ways. There are things that will hold back 
some of these trends that you see, these predictions that you see, uh, because the model is based on economics that doesn't take into account. Um, but there are also some trends on the positive side that the model doesn't take into account. Um, but you're right, there is actually new types of economic models that, being, that are being developed. On the political economy side, which is how governments actually make choices, again, you're absolutely right, uh, you know, it, it does respond to what voters want. So that's why we try, at least in this, to show the implications for things that matter to governments, jobs, tax revenues, import bill, I didn't show you the import bill, the oil import bill goes down, health of people, water use, all of that. Yeah. The actual problem I find in uh, economical vantage point of uh, handling the issue. We can take the example of IDA, uh, Inter Industrial Dispute Act, Article 25K. The assumption is the exploitation of labor is through from the uh, larger sectors. So systematic exploitation, so we need to take some actions. But what happened here is we are restricting R&D. Indirectly, we are not allowing the small case sector to growth. So a rational point of view from the small scale is not we can avoid this threshold by maintaining ourselves into a uh, medium or the small scale sector to avoid the taxes and uh, obligations for the laborers. So uh, we can take the uh, taxes on the carbon. And it has some whole negative aspects can be result in an aleatory um, uh, effects. So that's my... Audience. No, you're absolutely right. In fact, all of the issues that we spoke about are magnified for the micro, small, and medium enterprises. The inability to access capital, uh, the inability to actually take advantage of those cost-saving opportunities, energy-saving opportunities, and the inability to reskill. So a lot of our work is actually now focusing very much on the MSME sector, particularly in sectors which are going to have a major transition, electric mobility, um, you know, steel, uh, even things like app textiles and all of that. And on the labor issue that you spoke about, again, that is extremely important because in today's globalized economy, it is very hard to pinpoint who is the employer who's actually responsible for the welfare of the employer, of employees, for the workers. So when we talk about just transition, we really need to take into account whose responsibility it is to do this kind of reskilling, even safety nets and, and you know, worker welfare. Yeah. Thank you. I think for the, for the sake of time, uh, we have to stop here. So if you want to discuss further, maybe, you know, discuss offline, right? So uh, thank you, Ulka. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, and uh, thank you all for actually staying back, you know, to have this interaction. And uh, stay tuned for our next uh, uh, talk in the Let's Talk Climate Change series. Uh, thank you very much. So we come to the end of this session today. Thank you.